What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Those of you who have questions about the Catholic faith, maybe you just didn't know who to ask. Well, you can certainly ask us. Here's our phone number, 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you'd like to text us, you can text the letters EWTN to 55. 55- Zero, zero, zero. Wait for the response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates for some folks may apply. Again, the phone number 1-800-585-9396. Jeff Burson is our producer today. Matt Kabinsky is on, is on the phones. He's going to be uh, screening all of our calls that come in from you. Uh, Jeff is also handling social media today, which means if you want to pose a question via Facebook Live or YouTube, you can certainly do that. Again, the phone number 1-800-585-9396. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Doing very well, and you, my friend? Happy to be Catholic, happy to be doing Catholic Radio. That's a great answer. Here's a question that we received uh, via email. This is from Kevin, and it says, uh, Dear Dr. Anders, the Catholic Church places a lot of emphasis on the importance of sacrifice. Now, how does that square with texts like Proverbs 21.3, Hosea 6.6, 6, and Psalm 51. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. So um, the, the necessity of sacrifice for a meaningful religious life is something that is accessible not only from the texts of the New Testament, but even from just pure natural reason. You know, St. Paul exhorts Christians in Romans chapter 12. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Um, You know, the the priest in my parish often says that sacrifice is the language of love, and that is, uh, I think it's a beautiful statement. It captures so much of the truth about what makes life meaningful. It does. Um, I mean, can you imagine a life lived in which uh, a person said, I will not make any sacrifices. That's crazy. What a, what a banal, worthless, egotistical existence that would be. Yeah. You know, uh, love requires us to, to, uh, to, to sometimes to sacrifice our own interests, our own pleasures. Um, and sometimes our, we sacrifice the present in view of the future. We sacrifice our interests in the view of our children's interests, our spouse's interests. Um, soldiers may sacrifice their lives in defense of their country. I mean, the whole, the whole idea of giving up something of value uh, so that I can achieve some ennobling good, either either for myself, perhaps in the future, um, you know, might sacrifice present pleasures for future gains. Um, uh, isn't that? I mean, the whole the whole industry of finance is based around the idea of present and future value. You yep. can give up present use of your resources so you can acquire greater use of them in the future, mm-hmm. right? And the same thing is true in the spiritual life. All right, so uh, the, nothing in the New Covenant does away with the intrinsic necessity of sacrifice. And, of course, if we love God, I mean, what, of what's, what, what possible sense can it make to say, I love God, but I'm not going to sacrifice anything for him? Doesn't it doesn't make any, make any sense. sense at all. No, it doesn't no. make, any more that it makes sense to say, I love my wife, but I'm not going to sacrifice on her behalf either. Okay. So you're correct that there is a, there's a consistent note throughout the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, like, uh, that God, doesn't, does, God uh, prefers obedience to sacrifice. And of course, the, the sacrifices that are in view there, what are the sacrifices that God doesn't prefer to obedience? Well, we're talking about the sacrifice of goats and bulls, the ritual sacrifices of the Old Covenant, all right? And it is, it is embedded in the text of Scripture, Old and New Testament, that those sacrifices in themselves had no intrinsic ability to remove the guilt of sin or to reconcile us to God. They were a sign, a symbol, a token yeah. of our of our adherence to God, of our honoring God, of of the necessity of honoring God, and of giving up something of value on His behalf. Now, those Old Testament sacrifices, when they were conjoined to real interior contrition, could be valuable. So, King David, for instance, in Second Samuel, I think it's chapter twenty-four. Um, after he has ordered a census of the people of Israel contrary to God's command, and God rebukes him, 
And David says, whoops, and he repents. Uh, uh, an Israelite offers him uh, uh, some of his own flocks t- for David to offer in sacrifice in reparation for his sin. And David says, no, 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 I'm not going to take that. I refuse to offer God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. David himself, who wrote Psalm 51, understood that the, the, the bare act of slaughtering an animal does nothing to a- appease or atone or, reconcil- or, or, or conciliate God or propitiate God. Mm-hmm. What matters is the act of interior contrition combined with that outward sacrifice. Okay? Now, there, there was a, those sacrifices were commanded by God. The very God who says he doesn't take any pleasure in the blood of goats and bulls commanded those sacrifices be offered. Well, why? Okay. Well, first of all, because uh, while the outward sacrifice itself was not sufficient to atone for sin, it did have value in indicating the need the need to propitiate God for our sins, that we, that there's a real, uh, sin sets up a genuine barrier between us and the all-holy God, and, and atonement needs to be made. Now, perfect contrition, you know, that, that rending of the heart that David talks about in Psalm 51, mm-hmm. together with God's grace, was sufficient in the old covenant to reconcile people to God, all right? Um, those sacrifices also pointed to the, to the all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ, when he gave himself up on the cross, all right? And that sacrifice is made present to us in more than a symbolic way, not less than a symbolic way, in more than a symbolic way, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. As the Immaculate Victim Christ becomes truly present for us on the altar in Holy Mass, and therefore, when Christians make their own interior act of sacrifice, when we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, as St. Paul exhorts us to do, we can join our sacrifices to the sacrifice of Jesus who offered himself up on our behalf, and that gives to our sacrifice a, fancy word here, supererogatory value, an above and beyond value, a, a supernatural value that they could never have on their own. Mm-hmm. Because like, what even if God doesn't need the, the blood of goats and bulls, he doesn't need me either, right? True. I mean, at the end of the day, he doesn't need anything that I have to offer him. So my little sacrifices or whatever that might be, you know, give up cream in my coffee or something, you know, what big deal yeah, is that? doesn't yeah. mean anything to <laughs> God, right? All right? But if I join my interior sacrifices to that of Christ through the Mass, now all of a sudden my life takes on a supernatural quality that exceeds anything I could do in the natural. Yeah, makes all the difference. Kevin, thank you so much for your call or for your uh, email there. Uh, the address, if you'd like to send us an email, ctc at EWTN. Dot com, ctc at EWTN.com. When we come back from our quick break, we'll get to the phones here. 1-800-585-9396. This is called to Communion on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is called to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396. Well, it's certainly no surprise. As you know, the old saying, EWTN is everywhere. So it's no surprise we would get a text here from Albania. Uh, Sylvester wants to know, why can't priests marry? This is not in the Bible. Thank you. Well, so, uh, first of all, there are married Catholic priests. That's true. Um, have always been married Catholic priests. Uh, many more in the East than in the West, but there continue to be some married Catholic priests in the West. We have one in my own diocese of Birmingham here in Alabama, who's a friend of mine. So, uh, there are married Catholic priests. Uh, what what St. Paul says about the conditions for becoming a priest or a bishop in the pastoral epistles is that, that the priest can be the husband of but one wife. That's, that is biblical, all mm-hmm. right? Be the husband of one wife. And so it has always been the Catholic practice from the very beginning that uh, when a cleric who is married uh, becomes a widower, he remains unmarried. It's, it's one and done, Sure. all right? And that's, that remains a practice. And so clerical celibacy in antiquity far more often took the form of uh, older uh, widowed men, wid- you know, uh, uh, men whose wives had died, yeah. um, who just remained in that unmarried state until they died and performed their pastoral ministry. Now, the better question is, why, why that ideal? 
All right, that, that's ultimately a, a ordered towards the life of perfect continence. All right, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that idea of what, why, why is that preference embedded there, that even though marriage itself is a good thing, that for a cleric, it's better not to be married, such that when your wife dies, you remain unmarried until mm-hmm. death. And then that evolves, that discipline, of course, evolves, especially in the Latin church, toward just an outright preference for a clerical celibacy overall, so that a young man who feels a vocation to the priesthood today is required to take up, especially in the Latin church, the Western church, to take up that, that, that tradition of perfect continence. Well, again, this is a biblical ideal. So Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, for instance, uh, uh, extols those who, he says, make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. St. Paul talks about the same thing in, for his letter to the First Corinthians chapter 7. He says, you know, there, uh, some people are called to marriage, and that's fine, but if you have the gift, it's better that you remain unmarried. And he's very specific. He nails some specific circumstances. He says, if you're not married, you do better not to take a wife or a husband. All right. If you are married and you're a woman, for instance, and you, you shouldn't leave your husband, but if you do, you stay unmarried. You don't remarry. You don't marry somebody else. You stay right. unmarried or else be reconciled to your husband. Mm-hmm. If your spouse dies, St. Paul says, in my judgment, you're better off remaining unmarried. All right. So the preference in there for, perf- for a life of perfect continence is we find it in Jesus. We find it in St. Paul's letters. All right. Why? Well, Paul, again, tells us, he says, but even, even to the married, even to the married, he tells them that they should practice periodic continence so that they can give themselves to prayer. Hmm. All right. There's something about uh, the life of continence and self-control and sexual restraint that is conducive to contemplative life, to prayer, and to union with God. And there's also a practical reason also, Paul says, that those who marry are concerned about pleasing their spouse, pleasing their wives, uh, the things of this world. They have to be, and that's not a bad thing, all right? But those that are continent and celibate and and consecrate their virginity to the Lord can be wholly taken up with the work of the gospel, as he was, as St. Paul was. And so their overall preference there for the life of perfect continence and chastity, and especially for the clergy, is a very biblical, very biblical principle, all right? Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of flies in the face of a lot of our contemporary society, which seems to make a, make the highest good pleasure or personal satisfaction, all right? And Catholic Church prefers to put not, not pleasure, but happiness. Mm. Happiness is the end of human life. And happiness is a far more subtle and refined and noble experience of the good than mere pleasure, all right? Uh-huh. Because, you know, happiness can, can well, does, in fact, flow from my embrace of really arduous goods, difficult goods, uh, goods that require the commitment of a total life. You know, it's a whole life project. And there's hardly any more ennobling good than the good that the Catholic priest takes up when he seeks the sanctification and salvation of the world through the sacraments. All right. And for such a good, how fitting is it that he become an icon of, of total commitment and sanctity by committing his whole life, including his chastity, uh, to the Lord. That's why um, in in the canon of the Mass, we celebrate the virgin martyrs, people like St. Luthi, Agatha, Cecilia, and so mm-hmm. forth, who, who, who consecrated their lives. These are women, of course, not priests, but they consecrated their virginity to the Lord. And that's a, that was the, a, a, a major ideal in Christian antiquity. St. Jerome, in his uh, letter against Jovinian, says, uh, uh, he was kind of went over the top of it. He says, I praise marriage because it produces virgins. Ah. You know, St. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said, uh, ne- the only thing to be preferred to consecrated virginity, the only state of life preferable to virginity is martyrdom. Wow. Sylvester, thanks so much for your question. Thanks also for listening to us in Albania. If you're ready now, let's get to the phones at 1-800-585-9396. We begin with Dan in Chicago, listening online right now, EWTN.com. Hey there, Dan, what's on your mind today? How are you, sir? Uh, Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I I was trying to figure out what I can do with my sister. She um, she just recently converted to Judaism, and uh, I want to get her back to the Catholic faith. And how do you do that? I mean, I, how do I? What, what what do I have to do to tell her that she was baptized a Catholic and now she was baptized a Jew? How do I get her baptized back to a Catholic? Okay, I appreciate the question, Dan. So, uh, did she did she uh, convert to Judaism because of marriage? Has she married a Jew? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's what I figured. All right. So, so I I think honestly, this is we, we got to be in this thing for the long haul. Okay, and I don't think there's necessary there's not a quick fix, and and I think you gotta you gotta put that perspective on. I think the most important thing for you to do, 
uh, in the beginning is to totally affirm your love for your sister and let her know that you embrace her, that you love her, that you love her husband, that you love her family, that you're there for her.